you've had some strong statements, technical statements about the future of artificial intelligence recently, throughout your career actually, but recently as well. Uh, you've said that autoregressive LLMs are uh, not the way we're going to make progress towards superhuman intelligence. These are the large language models like GPT-4, like Llama 2 and 3 soon and so on. How do they work and why are they not going to take us all the way? For a number of reasons. The first is that there is a number of characteristics of uh, intelligent behavior. For example, the capacity to understand the world, understand the physical world, the ability to remember and retrieve things, um, persistent memory, the ability to reason, and the ability to plan. Those are four essential characteristics of intelligent uh, systems or entities, humans, animals. LLMs can do none of those, or they can only do them in a very primitive way. And uh, they don't really understand the physical world. They don't really have persistent memory. They can't really reason, and they certainly can't plan. And so, you know, if, if, if you expect a system to become intelligent just, uh, you know, without having the possibility of doing those things, uh, you're making a mistake. That is not to say that autoregressive LLMs are not useful. They're certainly useful. Um, that they're not interesting, that we can't build a whole ecosystem of uh, applications around them. Of course we can, but as, a path towards human level intelligence, they're missing essential components. And then there is another tidbit or, or fact that I think is very interesting. Those LLMs are trained on enormous amounts of text, basically the entirety of all publicly available text on the internet, right? That's typically on the order of uh, 10 to the 13 tokens. Each token is typically two bytes. So that's two 10 to the 13 bytes as training data. It would take you or me 170,000 years to just read through this at eight hours a day. <laughs> uh, so it seems like an enormous amount of knowledge, right, that those systems can accumulate. Um, but then you realize it's really not that much data. If you, you talk to developmental psychologists and they tell you a four-year-old has been awake for 16,000 hours in his or her life, um, and the amount of information that has uh, reached the visual cortex of that child in four years um, is about 10 to the 15 bytes. And you can compute this by estimating that the uh, optical nerve carry about 20 megabit megabytes per second, roughly. And so 10 to the 15 bytes for a four-year-old versus two times 10 to the 13 bytes for 170,000 years worth of reading, what that tells you is that uh, through sensory input, we see a lot more information than we, than we do through language. And that despite our intuition, most of what we learn and most of our knowledge is through our observation and interaction with the real world, not through language. Everything that we learn in the first few years of life, and uh, certainly everything that animals learn, has nothing to do with language. So it'd be good to uh, maybe push against some of the intuition behind what you're saying. So. It is true there's several orders of magnitude more data coming into the human mind uh, much faster, and the human mind is able to learn very quickly from that, filter the data very quickly. You know, somebody might argue your comparison between sensory data versus language, that language is already very compressed. It already contains a lot more information than the bytes it takes to store them if you compare it to visual data. So there's a lot of wisdom in language, there's words, and the way we stitch them together, it already contains a lot of information. So is it possible that language alone already has enough wisdom and knowledge in there to be able to, from that language, construct a, a world model, an understanding of the world, an understanding of the physical world that you're saying LLMs lack? So it's a big debate among uh, philosophers mm -hmm. and also cognitive scientists, like whether intelligence needs to be grounded in reality. Uh, I'm clearly in the camp that uh, yes, uh, intelligence cannot appear without some grounding in uh, some reality. It doesn't need to be 
you know, physical reality, it could be simulated, but um, but the environment is just much richer than what you can express in language. Language is a very approximate representation of our percepts and our mental models, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of tasks that we accomplish where we manipulate uh, a mental model of, uh, of the situation at hand, and that has nothing to do with language. Everything that's physical, mechanical, whatever, when we build something, when we accomplish a task, a modern task of you know grabbing something, etc., we plan or action sequences, and we do this by essentially imagining the result of the outcome of a sequence of actions that we might imagine, and that requires mental models that don't have much to do with language. And that's, I would argue, most of our knowledge is derived from that interaction with the physical world. So a lot of a lot of my, my colleagues who are more uh, interested in things like computer vision are really on that camp that uh, AI needs to be embodied, essentially. And then other people coming from the NLP side or maybe have you know, some, some other uh, motivation don't necessarily agree with that. Um, and philosophers are split as well. Uh, and the um, the complexity of the world is hard to um, it's hard to imagine. It, 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 uh, you know, it's hard to represent uh, all the complexities that we take completely for granted in the real world that we don't even imagine require intelligence. Right? This is the old Moravec paradox from the pioneer of robotics, Hans Moravec, who said, "You know, how is it that with computers it seems to be easy to do high level complex tasks like playing chess and?" solving integrals and doing things like that. Whereas the thing we take for granted that we do every day, um, like, I don't know, learning to drive a car or you know grabbing an object, we can't do with computers. <laughs> um, and y y you know we have LLMs that can pass, pass the bar exam, so they must be smart. But then they can't learn to drive in 20 hours like any 17-year-old. They can't learn to clear up the dinner table and fill up the dishwasher like any 10 year old can learn in one shot. Um, why is that? Like, you know, what, what are we missing? What, what type of learning or, or reasoning architecture or whatever are we missing that um, um, basically prevent us from, from, you know, having level five self driving cars and domestic robots? Can a large language model construct a world model? that does know how to drive and does know how to fill a dishwasher, but just doesn't know how to deal with visual data at this time. So it, it can operate in a space of concepts. So yeah, that's what a lot of people are working on. Uh, so the answer, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. And the more complex answer is you can use all kinds of tricks to get uh, uh, an LLM to basically digest uh, visual representations of representations of images uh, or video or audio for that matter. Um, and uh, a classical way of doing this is uh, you train a vision system in some way. And we have a number of ways to train vision systems, either supervised, semi-supervised, self-supervised, all kinds of different ways. Uh, that will turn any image into a high-level representation basically a list of tokens that are really similar to the kind of tokens that uh, typical LLM takes as an input. And then you just feed that to the LLM in addition to the text. And you just expect the LLM to kind of, uh, you know, during training to kind of be able to uh, use those representations to help uh, make decisions. I mean, there's been work on, along those lines for, for quite a long time. Um, and now you see those systems, right? I mean, there are LLMs that can that have some vision extension, but they're basically hacks in the sense that um, those things are not like trained end to end to to handle to really understand the world. They're not trained with video, for example. Uh, they don't really understand intuitive physics, at least not at the moment. So you don't think there's something special to you about intuitive physics, about sort of common sense reasoning about the physical space, about physical reality? That's, that to you is a giant leap that LLMs are just not able to do. We're not going to be able to do this with the type of LLMs that we are uh, working with today. And there's a number of reasons for this. But uh, the main reason is 
the way LLM are, LLMs are trained is that you, you take a piece of text, you remove some of the words in that text, you mask them, you replace, by, replace them by blank markers, and you train a gigantic neural net to predict the words that are missing. Uh, and if you build a, this neural net in a particular way, so that it can only look at uh, words that are to the left of the one it's trying to predict, then what you have is a system that basically is trained to predict the next word in a text, right? So then you can feed it uh, a text, a prompt, and you can ask it to predict the next word. It can never predict the next word exactly. And so what it's going to do is uh, produce a probability distribution over all the possible words in your dictionary. In fact, it doesn't predict words, it predicts tokens that are kind of subword units. And so it's easy to handle the uncertainty in the prediction there because there's only a finite number of possible words in the dictionary and you can just compute a distribution over them. Um, then what, you, what the system does is that it, it picks a word from that distribution. Of course, there's a higher chance of picking words that have a higher probability within that distribution. So you sample from that distribution to actually produce a word. And then you shift that word into the input. And so that allows the system not to predict the second word, right? And once you do this, you shift it into the input, etc. That's called autoregressive prediction, um, which is why those LLMs should be called autoregressive LLMs. Uh, mm -hmm. But we just call them LLMs. And there is a difference between this kind of process and a process by which before producing a word, when you talk, when you and I talk, you and I are bilingual. Mm -hmm. We think about what we're going to say, and it's relatively independent of the language in which we're going to say it. When we, when we talk about, like, a, I don't know, let's say a mathematical concept or something, mm -hmm. the kind of thinking that we're doing and the answer that we're planning to uh, produce is not linked to whether we're going to say it in French or Russian or English. Chomsky just rolled his eyes, but I understand. So you're saying that there's a, a bigger abstraction that that's uh, that goes before language. Yeah, that maps onto language. Right. It's certainly true for a lot of thinking that we that we do. Is that obvious that we don't like? You're saying your thinking is same in French as it is in English. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Or is this like how how flexible are you? Like, if if there's a probability distribution. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it depends what kind of thinking, right? If it's just. Uh, if it's like producing puns, I get much better in French than English about that. <laughs> no, but so <laughs> right, much right. worse. Depending. Is there an abstract representation of puns? Like, is your humor an abstract rep Like when you tweet, uh, and your tweets are sometimes a little bit spicy, uh, what's, is there an abstract representation in your brain of a tweet before it maps onto English? There is an abstract representation of uh, imagining the reaction of a reader to right. that uh, text. Or you start with laughter and then figure out how to make that happen. Or, start, no, or figure out a, like a reaction you want to cause and, right. then, and then figure out how to say it, right? Okay. So that it causes that reaction. But that's like really close to language. But think about like a mathem mathematical concept uh, or, uh, you know, imagining uh, you know, something you want to build out of wood or something like mm -hmm. this, right? The kind of thinking you're doing has absolutely nothing to do with language, really. Like it's not like you have necessarily like an internal monologue in any particular language. You're... you're you know, imagining mental models of, of the thing, right? I mean, if I, if I ask you to, like, imagine what this uh, water bottle will look like if I rotate it huh. 90 degrees, um, that has nothing to do with language. And so, uh, so clearly there is, you know, a more abstract level of representation uh, in which we, we do most of our thinking and we plan what we're going to say if the output is, is, you know, uttered, words, as opposed to an output being, uh, you know, muscle actions, uh -huh. right? Um, we, we plan our answer before we produce it. And LLMs don't do that. They just produce one word after the other, instinctively, if you want. It's like, it's a bit like the, you know, subconscious uh, actions where you don't, like you're distracted, you're doing something, you're completely concentrated, and someone comes to you and, uh, you know, ask you a question and you kind of answer the question. You don't have time to think about the answer, but the answer is easy, so you don't need to pay attention. You sort of respond automatically. That's kind of what an LLM does, right? It doesn't think about its answer, really. Uh, it retrieves it because it's accumulated a lot of uh, knowledge, so it can retrieve some, some things, but it's going to just spit out one token after the other without planning the answer. 
but you're making it sound just one token after the other, one token at a time generation is uh, bound to be simplistic. But if the world model is sufficiently sophisticated that one token at a time, the the most likely thing it generates is a sequence of tokens is going to be a deeply profound thing. Okay, but then that assumes that the, those systems actually possess an right. eternal world model. So it really goes to the, I, I think the fundamental question is, can you build a, a really complete world model, not complete, but a uh, one that has a deep understanding of the world? Yeah, so can you build this, first of all, by prediction? Right. And the answer is probably yes. Can you predict, can you build it by predicting words? And the answer is most probably no, because language is very poor in terms of weak or low bandwidth, if you want. There's just not enough information there. So building world models means observing the world and uh, understanding why the world is evolving the way, the way it is. And then uh, the, the extra component of a world model is something that can predict how the world is going to evolve as a consequence of an action you might take, right? So what model really is, here is my idea of the state of the world at time t, here is an action I might take. What is the predicted state of the world at time t plus one? Now that state of the world does, do, does not need to represent everything about the world. It just needs to represent enough that's relevant for this planning of, of the action, but not necessarily all the details. Now here is the problem. Um, you're not going to be able to do this with generative models. So a generative model has trained on video, and we've tried to do this for 10 years. You take a video, show a system a piece of video, and then ask it to predict the reminder of the video. Basically, predict what's going to happen. One frame at a time. Do the same thing as sort of uh, the autoregressive LLMs do, but for video. Right. Either one frame at a time or a group of LBMs. frames at a time. Um, but yeah, uh, a large video model, if you want. Uh, the idea of, of doing this has been floating around for a long time. And at, uh, at FAIR, uh, some of our co colleagues and I have been trying to do this for about 10 years. Um, and you can't, you can't really do the same trick as with LLMs because, uh, you know, LLMs, as I said, you can't predict uh, exactly which word is going to follow a sequence of words but you can predict the distribution over words. Now, if you go to video, what you would have to do is predict the distribution over all possible frames in a video. And we don't really know how to do that properly. Uh, we, we, we do not know how to represent distributions over high dimensional continuous spaces in ways that are useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and that's, that there lies the main issue. And the reason we can do this is because the world is incredibly more complicated and richer in terms of information than, than text. Text is discrete. Uh, video is high dimensional and continuous. A lot of details in this. Um, so if I take a, a video of this room uh, and the video is, you know, a camera panning around, mm -hmm. um, there is no way I can predict everything that's going to be in the room as I pan around. The system cannot predict what's going to be in the room as the camera is panning. Maybe it's going to predict this is this is a room where there's a light and there is a wall and things like that. It can't predict what the painting on the wall looks like or what the texture of the couch looks like. Certainly not the texture of the carpet. So th there's no way it can predict all those details. So the, the way to handle this is, one way to possibly to handle this, which we've been working for a long time, is to have a model that has what's called a latent variable. And the latent variable is fed to a neural net and it's supposed to represent all the information about the world that you don't perceive yet and uh, that you need to augment uh, the, the system for the prediction to do a good job at predicting pixels, including the you know, fine texture of the, of the carpet and the, and the couch and, and the painting on the wall. Um, uh, that has been a complete failure, essentially. And we've tried lots of things. We tried uh, just straight neural nets. We tried GANs. We tried, uh, you know, VAEs, uh, all kinds of regularized autoencoders. We tried um, 
many things. We also tried those kind of methods to learn uh, good representations of images or video um, that could then be used as input to, for example, an image classification system. Mm -hmm. And that also has basically failed. Like all the systems that attempt to predict missing parts of an image or video, um, for, you know, uh, uh, from a corrupted version of it, basically. So, right, take an image or a video, corrupt it or transform it in some way, and then try to reconstruct the complete video or image from the corrupted version. And then hope that internally the system will develop a good representations of images that you can use for object recognition, segmentation, whatever it is. That has been essentially a complete failure. And it works really well for text. That's the principle that is used for LLMs, right? So what, what, where is the failure exactly? Is it that it's very difficult to form a good representation of an image, a good, in a, like a good embedding of all, all the important information in the image? Is it in terms of the consistency of image to image to image to image that forms the video? Like where, what are the, if we do a highlight reel of all the ways you failed, what, what's that look like? Okay, so the reason this doesn't work uh, is, first of all, I have to tell you exactly what doesn't work because there is something else that does work. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing that does not work is training a system to learn representations of images by training it to reconstruct uh, a good image from a corrupted version of it. Okay, that's what doesn't work. And we have a whole slew of techniques for this uh, that are you know, variant of denoising autoencoders, something called MAE, developed by uh, some of my colleagues at FAIR, masked autoencoder. So it's basically like the, you know, LLMs or, 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 or things like this, where you train the system by corrupting text, except you corrupt images, you remove patches from it, and you train a gigantic neural net to reconstruct. The features you get are not good. And you know they're not good because if you now train the same architecture, but you train it supervised mm -hmm. with uh, label data, with text, textual descriptions of images, et cetera, you do get good representations. And the performance on recognition tasks is much better than if you do this self-supervised pre-training. So the architecture is good. The architecture is good. The architecture of the encoder is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the fact that you train the system to reconstruct images does not lead it to produce, to learn good generic features of images. When you train in a self-supervised way. Self-supervised by reconstruction. Yeah, by reconstruction. Okay, so what's the alternative? <laughs> <laughs> the alternative yes. is uh, joint embedding. What is joint embedding? So, what are what are these architectures that you're so excited about? Okay, so now instead of training a system to encode the image and then training it to reconstruct the, the full image from a corrupted version, you take the full image, you take the corrupted or transformed version, you run them both through encoders, Mm -hmm. which, which in general are identical, but not necessarily. And then you you train a predictor on top of those uh, encoders um, to predict the representation of the full input from the representation of the corrupted one. Mm -hmm. Okay? So Great. joint embedding, because you're, you're taking the, the full input and the corrupted version, or transform version, run them both through encoders, so you get a joint embedding and then you and then you you're saying can i predict the representation of the full one from the representation of the corrupted one okay um and i call this a jepa so that means joint embedding predictive architecture because there's joint embedding and there is this predictor that predicts the representation of the good guy from from the bad guy um and the big question is how do you train something like this uh and until 5 years ago or 6 years ago we didn't have particularly good answers for how you train those things, except for one uh, called contrastive, tra uh, contrastive learning, where, uh, and the idea of contrastive learning is you, you take a pair of images that are, again, an image and a corrupted version or degraded version somehow, or transformed version of the original one, and you train the predicted representation to be the same as, as, as that. If you only do this, the system collapses. It basically completely ignores the input and produces representations that are constant. Mm -hmm. So the contrastive methods avoid this, and, and those things have been around since the early 90s. I had a paper on this in 1993. Um, is you also show pairs of 
images that you know are different. And then you push away the representations from each other. So you say, not only do representations of things that we know are the same, should be the same or should be similar, but representation of things that we know are different should be different. And that prevents the collapse, but it has some limitation. And there's a whole bunch of uh, techniques that have appeared over the last six, seven years um, that can revive this, this type of method. Um, some of them from FAIR, some of them from, from Google and other places. Um, but there are limitations to those contrastive methods. What has changed in the last uh, you know, three, four years is now, now we have methods that are non-contrastive, so they don't require those negative contrastive samples of images that, are, that we know are different. You, can only, you, you turn them only with images that are you know, different versions or different views of the same thing. Uh, and you rely on some other tweaks to prevent the system from collapsing, and we have half a dozen different methods for this now.